of weeks ago, I finished a YouTube series where I dug into the code base of an open source project called React. You can say I kind of understood it, but I struggled a lot and then settled for a kind of shallow understanding of how the whole library works. Preact is a JavaScript library that is a lightweight alternative to React. It implements all the API of React, but then its size is only 3KB. In this video, I'll be talking about uh, my learnings that I took away from this project and all the stuff that I found interesting and did not know of before. Hi, hi everyone. Welcome to a new video on my channel. This one is about all of the things that I learned about Preact from my Code Mud Reads Preact series. One of the first things that I learned was this concept called Code Golfing. Code Golfing is a recreational programming practice where people kind of uh, solve problems or algorithm using the least amount of code that, as much as they can. The term comes from the concept of golfing itself, which is a game where players aim to get uh, the smallest number of points uh, as opposed to other sports where uh, everyone always aims to be the highest scorer. Uh, for example, this website called uh, JS1K uh, conducts uh, yearly competitions where people make cool demos uh, and the restriction is that all of the JavaScript has to fit in 1KB. Uh, it's actually pretty incredible what you can achieve with just 1KB of code. The Preact team applies this principle to build themselves a whole JavaScript library for 3KB. It's pretty incredible to see how they have maintained uh, this limit across 10 major releases. Although I have to raise a disclaimer that the 3KB is for the core diffing and comparing part of the library. If you want to use uh, SSR or hooks or things like that, these will be plugins and the library itself uh, uh, implements a rudimentary plugin kind of uh, interface uh, for this to work out. As I read through the code base, I encountered various techniques that the developers use to maintain this limit of 3 kilobytes and here are a few that I noticed. They reuse variables all the time. This was kind of confusing to me but uh, the Preact uh, author himself uh, explained to me that uh, this was one of the techniques they use to keep the code base uh, small. Also they had uh, various instances in the code base where they used uh, chained setters so you could see a equals b equals something else uh, where they used uh, uh, a single line to set different kind, different variables for different purposes. I also confirmed that they they use uh, let instead of const because let is a few characters smaller. This is not particularly useful right now because most of the code uh, because all of the code gets transpiled anyways to use var. But then if Preact starts shipping different bundles to modern browsers, then this could come into play. In the third episode, I totally got sucked into this whole. Uh, uh, bug fix that was already present that I didn't understand very well in the beginning. I learned that when JavaScript is not in strict mode, if you reuse, uh, if you replace the variables that came in through your arguments, then it changes the arguments uh, array itself, uh, which was pretty mind blowing for me. Uh, this pared down examples that one of the core team members shared kind of explains the problem uh, in its entirety. Yeah, when uh, JavaScript is bad, it can be really, really bad. So uh, always use strict kids. Uh, everyone and their moms on Twitter seem to be telling me that uh, uh, if you want to learn how React works, build your own React, build your own diffing algorithm, which is, you know, a pretty big ask to ask of someone uh, who has, who rarely has time to work on such projects. But going to Preact's code base kind of gave me an intuition of how a diffing algorithm could generally work. Uh, in this episode, I made a whole flowchart of my understanding of the diffing algorithm in Preact. Uh, so yeah, go check it out if you would want to build your own um, Preact or React or whatever for learning purposes, maybe it'll help you. I'm definitely not an expert, but I assume that maybe this is how all virtual DOM based uh, frameworks, libraries, frameworks slash libraries work. Maybe not Swelt. Swelt is something that I want to make a video on in the future. Yeah, let me know if you would like to see that from me. I also learned about a different bundler called uh, Micro Bundle, 
Uh, this is not a bundler that's written from scratch. Instead, it's an opinionated wrapper over roll-up. Uh, so micro bundle is uh, th in theory a zero config uh, bundler. It specializes in outputting an optimized bundle, and it's written by the author of uh, original author of Preact, Jason Miller. Mangle.json uh, is a configuration that is accepted by Tercer. Uh, Tercer is what Uglify is called now. The main thing that an Uglifier does is it shortens your code base, uh, it shortens your bundles uh, and uh, replaces long function names, variable names with small ones wherever possible. Mostly you don't have a say in what these replacements will be, but with Mangle.json you can do just that. You can say that this particular pattern should always be replaced with this particular pattern. The Preact team uses this because they have a whole suite of plugins which they want to work uh, seamlessly with their Preact. So to maintain uniformity among these, they use a Mangle.json to say which uh, uh, things should be mangled in which manner. There was a section in the code base where I found this detailed explanation of what an async API should look like. Uh, this is something that I have been using in my work every day, uh, and but I only had an intuition of this and I had not read any theory or philosophy behind this, so these articles were pretty useful. What they basically said was, if you had an API that sometimes behaved asynchronously and sometimes behaved synchronously, you would want to make sure that the API always outputted an asynchronous output. Uh, that is, the you would wrap the synchronous part in a promise that resolves immediately, maybe. So this is something I've done a lot of times, but yeah, it was nice to read the articles. Uh, maybe you should go check them out. I'll link them in the description. Overall, this YouTube series was a huge learning project for me. Uh, while I honestly believe that uh, all the techniques for code golfing will not work for me as I work in a very large code base that has to be maintained by a ton of people, uh, it's pretty awesome to see that uh, Preact has been able to make this work consistently and uh, it's a well-used uh, library now. Maybe if you're a library author, it's worth for you to look to preact and see what you can do to reduce the footprint of your library. Uh, what I kind of took away from this is that I should strive to have lesser code in my code base. Sometimes there may be a lot of abstractions and when you try to implement something new on an already existing code base, you might be tempted to reuse these abstractions as they are without actually understanding the underlying business logic. So after this project, I have resorted to uh, cutting through all the abstractions to find the actual business logic and then question the validity of all these abstractions and whether I need them. Uh, this has led to some refactorings that I have made that have made the code a uh, little simpler and a little clearer to everybody. Uh, a big thanks again to the Preact uh, team. If you want to contribute to Preact, you may find it helpful to, to, to go through my Code Mart Reads Preact series uh, where I read through almost every single line in that code base. But the project also led them to update uh, their documentation to reflect answers to more newbie questions uh, like the ones that I asked in my videos. Yeah, go through the new readme and the new contributing uh, markdown files uh, to see whether it's helped you. And if you have more questions, you should go ask to the Preact team. They are a really cool bunch. Uh, thank you so much for watching uh, uh, and I'll see you next week. Bye!